Good afternoon, and welcome to another great WEP 2018 event. Today's speaker, Leslie Dewan, took care of her question of post-PhD employment in an interesting way. Three years before she graduated, she started the company, Transatomic Power, of which she is now the CEO. She did this during evenings and weekends while completing her PhD in radiation damage to materials using op initio or first principles molecular dynamics. Eventually, Transatomic Power attracted investments from Silicon Valley billionaires Peter Thiel and Elon Musk, and the rest is history in the making. I was fortunate enough to track Leslie's thesis progress through being an advisor to the US Department of Energy's Computational Science Graduate Fellows Program, which supported her work at MIT, from which institution she received both her PhD in nuclear engineering and her bachelor's in nuclear and mechanical engineering. Her company remains rooted in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Leslie was awarded an MIT Presidential Fellowship in addition to her Department of Energy Computational Fellowship, and she's now a member of MIT's Board of Trustees, the so-called MIT Corporation. In 2013, the year that she graduated, she was named one of Time Magazine's 30 people under 30 changing the world. Hence, very much in the spirit of Kaust's ambition, it is a personal privilege and a pleasure to welcome to the WEP 2018 podium, Leslie Dewan for her lecture, Save the World Through Nuclear Power. Leslie. Thank you all so much for having me here. It's just an absolute thrill um, to be visiting KAUST. I've been wanting to, um, to come to see the campus and talk to the people here for a, a very, very long time, for many years. So it's just an absolute delight. Thank you all very much. So I became a nuclear engineer in the first place because I'm an environmentalist. So I believe that the world needs nuclear power alongside solar and wind and hydro and geothermal, if we want to avoid the devastating consequences of producing power by burning coal in particular. Um, the environmental damage caused by coal cannot be understated. So this image here shows the air pollution that can occur in Beijing. So on the left hand side is one of the bad air days. On the right hand side is one of the comparatively rare good air days. So I was, um, I'm in Beijing fairly frequently for work, and so I've been able to see this firsthand. And when you have days like the one on the left, it's, um, it's like being in a video game with a short render distance, and you can feel it in your lungs. You can feel uh, very viscerally what, is, um, what the consequences are of getting power from coal. So in a carbon-free grid, wind and solar power in particular are a fairly easy sell. People like wind power, people like solar power, that, um, that works pretty readily. But how do you approach incorporating nuclear, which is a form of power generation that has a tremendous amount of baggage that's associated with it? So nuclear, it has issues with perception of the safety, and it has waste that's produced that's around for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, there are potential proliferation issues with nuclear, and there's the high cost of the conventional nuclear power plants. Um, and on top of this, because of this, there's substantial public opposition to nuclear power in many different countries. So today I'll be telling you about my approach to this, how I hope to address those four key problems of safety, waste, proliferation, and cost. And in doing so, I'm gonna be talking about how nuclear power technology got to its current state. I'll be uh, going into a bit of the history of the nuclear power industry since the 1950s and um, talking about what went wrong and where we can go with it in the future, most importantly, and where people are starting to go with it now. So the public opposition to nuclear, which is a crucial piece of the puzzle, is something that's always been incredibly interesting to me because this wasn't always the case. So in the very early days of the nuclear industry, there was genuine excitement about the technology and very good communication with the public. So here's a photograph uh, from the mid-1950s of the International Atomic Energy Agency's Mobile Radioisotope Training Laboratory. And it's, uh, 
on the steps of the Hofburg in Vienna. And um, so the IAEA, uh, in conjunction with the US Department of Energy um, under the Atoms for Peace program, built a large number of these uh, training laboratories. They went um, across Europe, and there were a number of them within the United States as well. And they were basically, um, well, they were mobile science fairs to teach people about this exciting new power technology that could potentially transform their lives for the better. And you know, they went to big cities, they went to small towns, and there were people literally lined up at the door because they were, they were curious about what this was and how it could help them. There was this genuine spark of interest and excitement there. Um, and amazingly enough, Walt Disney was also a part of this. So in uh, 1956, Walt Disney produced the book and accompanying animated feature, Our Friend the Atom, which is a Tomorrowland adventure, um, in which he sought to explain the science of nuclear technology, um, showing that ultimately nuclear power is just a fancy way of boiling water into steam to drive a turbine to produce electricity. Um, well, at the same time, capturing this inherent wonder that something as small as an atom could produce so much power. Um, you can also look up this, uh, the video on YouTube if you want to see it in its full glory. You can find the book on eBay. There's still a number of copies available. I have not yet bought up all of them. I highly, highly recommend it for this look into um, you know, 1950s Americana describing nuclear power technology. Um, now, to get into this a little bit more, so, you know, nuclear reactors is a fancy way of boiling water, I want to include this little uh, cartoon schematic about nuclear power. I know you all have engineering backgrounds, but it's something that, um, you know, even for me as a nuclear engineer, it was like, you know, it, it's, it's not, like, totally obvious how a nuclear reactor works. Like, it's fairly, uh, some parts of it can be... Uh, a little bit abstract, but I think this image shows it pretty clearly. Also, the slide is used in pretty much every single introductory nuclear engineering course that I've ever taken, and so I always, I like to include it as <laughs> sort of a reflection of that. Okay, so on the far left of this image, you have the nuclear containment, and so this is what the big dome is, um, if you see that, that dome in a nuclear reactor. Uh, the containment is several feet thick of steel and concrete. It needs to, in a worst case scenario accident, withstand hundreds of atmospheres of pressure if you have a break in the main lines of the nuclear reactor and you have too much steam being produced. So inside that big containment dome, on the far left, you have the reactor vessel. And that's where uh, the system is in what's called a critical configuration. So you have a large, stable number of nuclear fission reactions that generate a great deal of heat. And in a conventional uh, light water reactor like this, your fuel rods there are uh, pellets of solid uranium oxide arranged into rods held in place with a thin metal scaffolding. They have water flowing past them. The water both cools the rods, carries the heat away, and the water also moderates the reaction. So it slows the neutrons down to make them more likely to induce fission. So solid uranium oxide fuel rods, water flowing past it. As the water flows past it, it's heated up into steam. That steam drives a turbine, which turns a generator, which produces electricity. And then the water coming out of the turbine, the steam rather, coming out of the back end of the turbine is condensed back into water. Then it's pumped right into the bottom of the reactor, and the process begins again. So that's how a typical nuclear reactor works. And a lot of the new nuclear technology, which I'll be getting into a few slides from now, you know, the right-hand side of the picture is effectively the same. You're still boiling water into steam to drive a turbine to produce electricity, but it's what's going on on the left-hand side that's a little bit different. So it's different types of fuel, different arrangements of fuel, um, sometimes, in some cases, liquid fuel rather than solid fuel even, which introduces some interesting factors. So to go back from that, back to... Uh, back to the 1950s here. So at the same time as uh, Disney and the mobile radioisotope training laboratory and all of that communication, um, there was a substantial amount of new nuclear technology being developed and uh, new applications for that technology as well. There was this tremendous sense of blue sky thinking that was going on. Like there was no sense of 
of what the limits were. It was like scientists had this, you know, this new toy to play with in a lot of ways. And so they said, all right, well, what if, um, what if we make nuclear-powered cars, for example? So this is the prototype Ford Nucleon, um, which tragically was never produced. They just made the small models of it. Um, but there's also nuclear-powered airplanes. Um, both the US and the Soviet Union were designing uh, different types of nuclear-powered airplanes that would, in effect, be analogous to nuclear-powered submarines. So these were, these were very interesting. Actually, if we go to the next slide quickly, you can see how large the potential engines for these designs would be. So this is our founding team. This photo was taken ages and ages ago, right after we incorporated the company. Um, Founding team standing at the Idaho National Lab next to some of the uh, prototypes for the aircraft reactor experiment. So U.S. and the Soviet Union were both developing tests for nuclear-powered aircraft, putting nuclear reactors on airplanes so they'd be able to make an airplane that could stay in the sky for months at a time. And the application for that really was so that they'd be able to drop bombs on enemy territory at a moment's notice. And so research on those nuclear-powered aircraft continued for, um, for several decades until it was ultimately obviated by the development of the intercontinental ballistic missile. So that's something that really almost came to fruition, which is both terrifying and, and like deeply fascinating at the same time. Um, Another piece of this is nuclear-powered submarines. Now, these I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about, because these get very, very interesting here. So in many respects, submarines are why we kind of got into the mess with existing nuclear reactors that we're in right now. So nuclear submarines were like the genesis, really, for why the nuclear industry is in its current state. And I'll explain that now. Um, this is the USS Nautilus, which is the world's first nuclear-powered submarine, which was completed in 1959. This is a photo of it at its commissioning. Um, it, uh, similar to the, the diagram I showed you of the nuclear power react, the land-based power reactors, its core uses the pellets of solid uranium oxide uh, cooled by liquid water. And that, was, that type of design was actually first developed for these nuclear-powered submarines. And it's, it's a beautiful design, and it works very well, and it's very much optimized for submarine use. It's optimized for use in a water environment, in an underwater environment, even. Now, immediately after developing the nuclear submarine, the US wanted to develop commercial civilian nuclear power plants. And as a point of national pride, the US wanted to get these land-based civilian commercial nuclear power plants up and running as quickly as possible, specifically before the USSR was able to do this. And so instead of spending another decade kind of optimizing a new type of nuclear reactor design for use on land, the US instead took this submarine reactor design for its first commercial power station. So this is the shipping port reactor, uh, which was first turned on in shipping port, Pennsylvania in 1957 so just a few years after the first nuclear-powered submarine. And these types of designs work, you know, using a submarine reactor design works, and it works well, but you can see how they might have some significant problems, because you're taking a design that's optimized for use on water and bringing it on land. So a significant issue is that these conventional nuclear reactor designs, and effectively, just to, just to emphasize this, 100% um, of the reactors um, in the US and almost all of the operating power reactors worldwide are this type of design, this light water reactor design that originally was developed for use in submarines. So one of the issues with these is that they need a constant supply of external electric power, so you can continually pump water over the core to keep it from heating up catastrophically. So in a submarine, in your worst case scenario, you're not going to worry about having enough water available. But when you're on land, you need to think about having many, many auxiliary power systems, um, you know, backup diesel generators, backup batteries, so that your pumps always have power. Um, and you have to be there, very thoughtful about, well, what if you have a line break so you don't have the piping available to pump water? You need to have... Um, effectively buckets of water above and below your reactor core so that you will always be able to deliver cooling water to your reactor design. And those, um, 
those uh, restrictions both decrease the safety of the design and make it much more expensive because you need all of those auxiliary systems to bring the safety up. Um, and so if you lose, if you have the worst case scenario accident, if you lose your external electric power, if you lose your pumping, if your core becomes uncovered, it heats up, it heats up, it's unable to be cooled down and the fuel eventually starts to melt. And that's what a meltdown is. When you're not able to carry away enough heat from the uranium oxide fuel rods and it eventually starts to melt. Now, the world uh, has had three meltdowns of commercial nuclear power plants. So the first was at Three Mile Island in 1979, and then at Chernobyl in 1986, and then most recently at Fukushima in 2011. Um, I was incredibly lucky to be able to visit the Fukushima site just this past April, in April of 2017, and it was amazing how moving it was to see um, to see what happened at the site. There weren't, there weren't any deaths, of course, from Fukushima, but being able to see, uh, it just really drove home for me the consequences of you know, what happens when something goes wrong at this scale and how you need to you know, do everything you can to ensure that you have adequate safety systems for nuclear reactors. So, if we go back again to Three Mile Island back in, 70, in 1979, so that was one of the, the first big commercial nuclear power accidents. Um, so that accident, in addition to causing a great deal of fear, it also served to stifle innovation in a lot of ways um, in 1979, and in particular, it locked in the existing conventional nuclear power technology. The sense of optimism and blue sky thinking largely disappeared from the industry and people tended to hunker down with what they had and with what they knew. Um, one of the really interesting things you can look at is uh, a graph of the age distribution of nuclear engineers and it's a very, very bifurcated age distribution. And you have one peak of people who are in their 60s and 70s who are kind of ending their careers who are close to retirement, and you have a gap in the middle. And then it starts to pick up again, and you tend to have a lot of nuclear engineers now who are you know, in their 20s, who are in their 30s. And that gap in the middle was caused directly by Three Mile Island and Chernobyl. A generation of people effectively left the industry. So there were several decades where there just kind of wasn't enough manpower to work on new types of nuclear engineering design. And it wasn't until very, very recently, like 10 years ago, maybe like 15 years ago at the most, do you finally you know, have enough people to start looking at this type of technology. A generation has passed, and now we're able to um, start addressing it and start, start addressing these challenges directly and figuring out new technological solutions to make things better. And a lot of what this new generation of young nuclear engineers are, are trying to do, in the included, is to figure out you know, if there's a better path. Like, can we go back to the early days of the nuclear industry, um, you know, both recapture that optimism and you know, maybe look at some of those designs that were tried and abandoned in the 1950s, 1960s, early 1970s. Like, what if we could take the incredibly safe aircraft reactor design um, or look at what they were doing with the nuclear-powered cars and figure out a way to, um, to incorporate that into the new generation of nuclear technology? So, yeah, like, how do you address the underlying problems? Now, to start, this is a... Um, a graph, I, I put together a very similar version of this in one of my notebooks when I was in grad school ages and ages ago. I was talking with a classmate of mine, um, and we were trying to figure out, like, well, where, where do we go from here? And actually, to go, to go into a little bit of an anecdote, because I have some time. So um, we were, my co-founder and I were studying for our qualifying exams in the PhD program uh, in MIT's nuclear engineering department. and. When we were uh, taking breaks from study, you know, we'd been spending hours and hours a day studying for our qualifying exams, because if you fail them, you get kicked out of the PhD program, and so we really, really wanted to make sure that we would pass. Um, and in our kind of off hours, 
we were reading through a lot of books in the MIT Nuclear Engineering Department Library, because that's like, it's like slacking off, but it's not really slacking off, because we were reading, you know, nuclear en en engineering books. Um, and one of the things that we were struck by was, you know, the sense of optimism and excitement in these old journal articles, and also the wide array of technologies that they were looking at. And so we said, okay, well, like, what are the six broad categories of technologies that people were talking about then and that are, you know, still around today as sort of advanced reactor or next generation reactor nuclear technologies? So those main types of reactors are listed on the top up there, a supercritical water reactor, a very high temperature reactor that uses like pebble bed fuel, molten salt reactor, that one will be important, uh, sodium fast reactor, lead fast reactor, which is cooled by molten lead, and then a gas cooled fast reactor. Six main categories there. We said, okay, we'll take those six reactor types and we'll evaluate them on three key criteria. So like, what are the three most important things of the next generation of nuclear reactor? And so the first one, is that the reactor have high burn-up, so you're utilizing as much of the uranium fuel as possible and leaving behind the smallest amount of long-lived waste. The second is that it be a low-pressure system, ideally operating at atmospheric pressure rather than the 100 times atmospheric pressure that a conventional reactor operates at. This minimizes the driving force that could potentially push radioactive material beyond the site boundary in an accident. And then lastly, we wanted the reactor to have a thermal spectrum as much as possible using um, neutrons with a lower energy than the very fast neutrons because that reduces material damage. It lets the reactor uh, operate for longer because you're not damaging your materials as much and it uh, decreases cost because you don't have to replace parts as often. And so when we laid it out like that, the six reactor types versus the three key criteria, we um, could see that molten salt reactors were um, really hitting all of those boxes. Molten salt reactors, they use liquid fuel rather than solid fuel, so we were already initially very drawn to them. And the other great thing about them is that there was an existence proof for it. So back in the mid to late 1960s at the Oak Ridge National Lab in Tennessee in the US, they built and operated a prototype molten salt reactor. So on the left, you can see uh, the reactor core as technicians are assembling it. And then on the right, uh, you can see the main reactor vessel as it's being dropped into place. And here is a top-down view of the reactor itself with a, uh, an engineer at the top for scale. Um, this reactor was, I believe, eight megawatts thermal. So it's a small-scale reactor not hooked up to power production. So molten salt reactors have tremendous safety benefits, mostly because of the different cooling requirements for liquid fuel as compared to solid fuel. Now here's a schematic of this type of reactor design, and you can see like the very super, the superficial similarities to the cartoon that I showed you before of the light water reactor. So effectively, everything on the right-hand side is um, is the same as what I showed you before. Heat exchanger boils water into steam, drives a turbine powers the generator, produces electricity. But what's interesting and different is on the left-hand side of this image. So on the left-hand side, you have the primary loop that contains the molten fuel salt. So it's, um, in our case, it's a lithium fluoride, uranium fluoride fuel that's heated up to about 600 degrees Celsius, so it's liquid. Um, that flows around the primary loop, and when that fuel is within the reactor core by virtue of its geometry and the fact that it's next to the moderator rods within the reactor core. It's in a critical configuration, so it's producing a great deal of heat. That heat is carried over via two sets of heat exchangers to the power production loop on the right. In the middle, you have an intermediate heat exchanger that's filled with a non-radioactive salt, and that's there as a safety mechanism so that you don't have radioactive salt immediately next to your power production loop. So if you have a break in your line, you have an additional safety barrier there. So the unique innovation that they came up with at the Oak Ridge National Lab for these reactors is um, shown in the, the freeze valve at the bottom of the primary loop. So the freeze valve is a plug of the same type of salt that's in the primary loop, only electrically cooled so that it's frozen solid. 
If you lose off-site electric power to your reactor, say if a you know, tsunami knocks out your power lines, your freeze valve loses its cooling, it automatically melts, and then all of the salt from the primary loop drains out via gravity into your auxiliary containment tank. And in the auxiliary containment tank, just by virtue of its geometry and the fact that it's no longer near your moderator rods, it immediately goes subcritical, so it's not producing nearly as much heat, and the small amount of remaining decay heat that's being produced can be sunk by natural convection that doesn't require any additional power. So it's able to cool itself down, and so if it, if it fails, it fails in a solid mode rather than in a liquid or gaseous mode. Over the course of a few hours, it freezes solid and remains in your auxiliary tank. And so any type of accident is contained within the site, and you're able to then ideally just reheat your salt and pump it back up into the primary loop when you're ready to start again. Um, with the Oak Ridge National Lab uh, reactor, towards the end of the project's lifetime, they were running out of funding, and so every Friday afternoon, um, this is what I've been told, they uh, triggered the freeze valve, drained out the salt, put it into the auxiliary containment, and then every Monday morning, melted it back up again, pumped it into the primary loop, and restarted the experiment. And so this means the terminology used for this type of passively safe reactor, it's what's called walk-away safe. So if you don't have off-site electric power, even if you don't have any operators on site, it's able to shut itself down. So it's a substantial benefit there. Now what's maybe kind of surprising, like they had a prototype for this reactor back in the late 1960s. They showed that it operated, they demonstrated these safety benefits, but they abandoned it. And the main reasons for their abandoning it was because it was very expensive. It was about two or three times the cost of other types of nuclear reactors at the time. Uh, it required highly enriched uranium as fuel. So it would work for a national lab prototype, but it really wouldn't work at commercial scale because of the proliferation risk. And it had a very bulky, uh, low power density core. And, I mean, also, this was before there had been any significant nuclear accidents. It was a decade before Three Mile Island, well before Chernobyl or Fukushima. And so they thought, well, why would we pay three times as much for a safer nuclear reactor when clearly we don't need one? And so the technology was, uh, was tabled. Now, when my co-founder and I started looking at this technology again, we said, okay, well, how, how do we improve it? How do we change it? And this table kind of summarizes the main changes that we were able to make here. So um, we said, all right, we're going to try and use new types of materials. So uh, the molten salt reactor experiment on the left here used graphite as their moderator. They needed 90% of their core to be graphite. It just had very thin channels um, within the graphite that would allow the fuel salt to flow through it. There were some material problems with the graphite as well. Um, as it became irradiated, because it had the radioactive salt flowing through it, it would um, start to swell and shrink and swell again. Um, your channels would change shape. It was very difficult to model thermodynamically, and it, it introduced a lot of problems. So we swapped that out for a uh, silicon carbide clad zirconium hydride moderator. In zirconium hydride, you're moderating with the hydrogen rather than with the carbon that's in graphite, so you're able to slow your neutrons down much more effectively, um, just by conservation of mass. And therefore, we don't need nearly as much moderator, and so we can fit about five times as much salt in the core as they were able to do uh, as compared to the molten salt reactor experiment. And then the other factor is that we changed the salt. So they used a lithium fluoride beryllium fluoride salt where you could dissolve in about one molar percent uranium. We switched it to just a lithium fluoride uranium fluoride salt without the beryllium, and it lets us have about 27 molar percent uranium. We have to operate at about 50 degrees Celsius higher to make that happen, but we have alloys now that make that possible that they didn't have back in the 1960s. So five times as much uranium in the salt, uh, sorry, uh, 27 times as much uranium in the salt, five times as much salt in the core. And this lets us both decrease the necessary fuel enrichment, so going from the 33% to 93% that they needed for that experiment down to 5% low enriched uranium, and at the same time increase the power density by a factor of about 16, which lets us make the whole system much more compact 
And uh, this is just a rough schematic of what our system looks like now. So you can see um, on the left-hand side, marked as A, is our reactor vessel, um, drain tank at the bottom E, and then pumps labeled with C uh, surrounding the reactor vessel there. And you can see some of the cooling system for the drain tank um, marked on the side there. Let me also go to this close-up of the reactor core here. So in addition to the changes with the moderator and the fuel within the reactor, uh, we also were changing the neutron spectrum of the design. So to further increase fuel efficiency, we use uh, variable moderation of the reactor to shift the spectrum over the course of its lifetime. So we gradually insert more moderator rods to soften the spectrum over the course of life. You can show that here. So at the beginning of life, which is shown with the solid line here, we have a slightly faster kind of epithermal to fast neutron spectrum that allows us to breed more uranium-238 up into plutonium that remains dissolved in the salt. And then as the reactor operates, we gradually insert more moderator rods, soften the spectrum so it becomes uh, like the dashed line marked end of life um, on the left there. And with that dashed line, we're able to maintain criticality for as long as possible. And then one other interesting feature uh, that you can notice on the dashed line here is that it has, um, it has two peaks, really. So there's the primary peak that's more on the, the thermal spectrum side, and then another peak on the faster spectrum side with very, very little in the middle. Um, so you have, uh, this gives a, this kind of indicates that we have a very, very good what's called neutron economy. So um, in that middle region there, sort of that, that kind of part of the epithermal region, you have a lot of um, neutrons that are captured by non-fissile material. So neutrons that are just captured by like the, the slew of other things in the periodic table that occur in a molten salt reactor. And when that happens, the neutron is wasted. And so it, and it just does not continue to further fission events. And so it's very good that we have this sort of barbell-shaped distribution at the end of life because it indicates that we have this very, very strong neutron economy and we're not wasting neutrons. And so this is what lets us get ultimately twice the fuel utilization as compared to an existing light water reactor. And therefore, we're leaving behind uh, less than half of the waste as compared to a light water reactor. So effectively getting twice the mileage compared to what we had before. And that is just summarized there with those changes. So we thought, um, okay, you know, this is, this is interesting technology. This is back in 2010 when my co-founder and I were first discussing this. And we thought, all right, well, what do we, what do we do with this reactor technology? Like, neither of us, you know, we could stay in academia, we could try and pursue this via na a national lab, um, but we were really excited about, you know, going out on our own and starting, um, starting our own venture, starting our own company that could work to very nimbly commercialize the technology as rapidly as possible. And so we decided this is our certificate of incorporation filed the 27th day of April, 2011. Um, that is just one day after the uh, 25th anniversary of Chernobyl, which is pretty interesting, um, not intentional at all. And um, the other thing to note here is, so this was April of 2011, which is just six weeks after Fukushima happened. So. My co-founder and I had been you know, discussing this throughout the latter half of 2010, primarily. Um, early 2011 is when we decided that we you know, wanted to uh, start a company, like raise some investment, and you know, go out on our own to commercialize this technology. Um, and then in March 11th, 2011, Fukushima happened. We thought, oh god, like, what, do we, what do we do now? Like, what does this mean for the nuclear industry? What does this mean for us? What should what should our next steps be? And after a lot of thought, we realized that this, um, it wasn't a signal to stop, it was a signal that we needed to push forward even harder, that it meant that the world really needs safer forms of nuclear power 
production. Like there could be no stronger indicator for that. And so six weeks after Fukushima, we decided to incorporate the company and move ahead with that. Our ultimate goal with this technology, so after incorporating, we said, all right, well, actually, we need to take this and bring it more closely to be a commercial product. So ultimately, we want to make a 520 megawatt electric reactor for grid scale power generation. So this is the right size to replace the coal power plants that are coming offline in the US and serve as an alternative for other coal power plants that would be built worldwide. And um, prior to that, so our nearer term goal is building a prototype facility to be able to test this. So the Nuclear Regulatory Commission within the US requires you um, quite sensibly to build a smaller scale prototype, gather operating data, show that it works before you can move on to um, building your larger scale commercial facility. Now, I want to talk a little bit more, like not just about the technology, but also the, the other pieces that go into starting a company. And so one of the most important pieces with starting a company is having enough money to fund it. Actually, let me go back to this slide for a bit longer. Um, so we had been you know, developing on our own some of the initial plans, um, you know, blueprints for what it would look like, uh, ran some computer simulations, did the initial spec work, set up some initial partnerships. And then we started talking to venture capital investors um, around Boston and New York and San Francisco. And we kept on having the same conversation over and over with people. We said, all right, this is, this is what the technology can do. Um, this is our pathway to commercialization. We're, um, you know, we see these immense benefits. Uh, and they were, they were sold on it. They were super excited. And they said, OK, we'll give you all this money. And we want one up and running in six months. And <laughs> we said, well, no, like, it's going to take 10 years minimum. Like, this is, this is a very, very long time process with nuclear. And they said, OK, well, we could give you more money, and you could have it running in 12 months. And it just, it, it was frustrating, because, like, we were excited, they were excited, but there was just, like, an utter, like, mismatch of, of expectations, because the nuclear industry is fairly slow moving, and um, venture capital tends to be very fast moving. And so a lot of what we did was, was kind of trying to figure out how to fix that impedance mismatch between um, those two worlds. There weren't a lot of um, prior cases for nuclear startups being funded in the past. I think at the time there was maybe one nuclear startup that existed, maybe two or three. Um, so we didn't have those examples to look at, but we started thinking about companies that had invested in aerospace in the past, um, because aerospace, similarly, it's you know decade, multi-decade timescales. It's very large dollar amounts. And we started talking with um, Founders Fund. Uh, they were one of the first investors in Elon Musk's SpaceX and their investment portfolio that you can see underneath here. You know, they work on, you know, there's SpaceX down there, there's um, Lyft, there's uh, Zenefits, which is healthcare benefits. Um, they work in regulatory heavy industries, they work in hard technology, and they sort of get what it what it means to be doing this. Like when we told them our timeline and dollar amount, they said, okay, well that's you know what it took to get the Falcon 9 off the ground. Like we, we get it, that was good. Um, and so they, they added us to their investment portfolio and led our, led our first round. Um, also on the version of their website that they had up then, um, they had a picture of the nuclear powered airplane on it saying like this was supposed to be the future. And so we knew basically from when we first saw that that they were, they were kindred spirits. So that worked out very nicely. Um, the other, I feel very silly for including this, so I'm going to talk about it super quickly. Um, so let me even skim over that slide because it's a bit much. Um, so it, it ended up being kind of big news that uh, a nuclear powered, a nuclear startup was getting funded, and so I was able to like go on CNN and on Fried Zakaria and kind of talk about what what nuclear technology could be, what nuclear technology should be, and it kind of allowed for a better platform for starting to discuss the technology with people. And because I think that's one of the crucial things with nuclear technology, you need to talk about how it works, what it, uh, what it does, what the costs and benefits are so that people can make informed decisions about you know, what it's going to be and what it's going to do. Um, so with that funding in place, uh, we're, we were able to develop blueprints for prototype scale facility, commercial scale facility. Um, currently, we are uh, 
working, um, basically we're doing lab scale tests of this right now. So we're a number of years away from being able to work on the prototype, for, or sorry, to go back a step. So working on blueprints now and um, lab scale experiments as well, um, some uh, in conjunction with national labs within the US and with other universities as well. And um, our immediate goal is the prototype plant. And so that'll still be a number of years away. So it won't be until the early 2020s when we'll be able to break ground on the prototype facility, a uh, number of years to build that, and you'll have to gather an additional two or three years of experimental data, and all that is before we'd be able to start work on the commercial scale facility. So it's a very, very long road there, but an exciting one at the same time. Um, Another interesting piece of this is the regulatory space as well, which um, I had thought at the beginning it would be an insurmountable hurdle because um, a number of years ago, um, you know, back in 2011, 2012, when, right when we were starting this, um, there was no pathway at all to develop, uh, you know, siting guidelines for advanced nuclear reactors. Um, but pleasantly, over the last few years, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, in conjunction with the IAEA and other international groups, has been, you know, figuring out how you how you cite an advanced reactor. Basically, like what is the checklist for um, for the regulatory and citing permits for advanced nuclear reactors? Um, and there's been significant legislative work on this as well. And I'm including this because it was, you know, my background is in engineering. I never really expected to be, um, you know, talking about policy at this level. But, you know, a few years ago, I was uh, kind of in parallel with my work here. I was invited to uh, testify in front of the, um, uh, the U.S. House of Representatives uh, Committee on Science, Space, and Technology about this need for an advanced reactor pathway. Um, and then following that, for a number of reasons, like Lord knows, not just me, but um, the House unanimously passed a bipartisan nuclear energy bill that was able to, that was um, uh, basically increasing, um, uh, showing the increased need to develop this regulatory pathway. And there have been similar legislative wins um, on the U.S. side over the past few years as well, um, both under the Obama administration and the current administration too. And. All of these effects, um, the legislative pieces, the great work from the U.S. Department of Energy, they've um, allowed for sort of a flourishing of the advanced reactor sector worldwide. And so this is sort of tallying up the research um, into advanced reactors. This is not just from startups. This is from, well, startups, uh, universities, and national labs. Um, but there's just over 100 of them worldwide. and about half of them, a surprisingly large fraction, are from privately funded nuclear startups. And these companies, we're, um, it's interesting, instead of being very fiercely competitive, which is what you might expect, um, the, in the sector is so young and there's so much space within it that people tend to be quite collaborative because we're working together to develop um, you know, supply chains that will help each other out to develop better computational tools, to develop um, regulatory uh, and anti-proliferation best practices, for example. So it's an incredibly exciting time to get into this sector because it's, you know, we're all writing it together. Now, I want to leave enough time for questions. I've <laughs> been talking a little bit longer than I intended to. Um, all right, two slides that I want to close with. So this is, uh, rather fanciful experimental rendering of what the full-scale commercial facility could look like. And one of the things that we had been playing around with is, um, can we use different architecture to change people's emotional relationship with nuclear power? You know, the design, as I mentioned, operates at atmospheric pressure, so you have a lot more flexibility in terms of the civil engineering and architectural design of the plant. And so we said, all right, instead of the big containment dome, we could have sort of this hyperbolic structure over it to protect from missile attack, which is one of the main um, design criteria that you have to uphold. Um, and I think that you can, you can use this new type of design to make people think about nuclear power differently. So for example, like when I'm driving down the highway and I see wind turbines in the distance, it just like makes me happy on this deep emotional level that I can't quite explain. Like I like that power is being generated from that carbon free source. You know, when people see the typical 
dome and stacks of a nuclear power plant, I think there tends to be a fear response. But I want people to you know, see these advanced nuclear reactor designs and have that same good feeling that they feel when they see a wind turbine and say, all right, this is nuclear power, but it's a different type of nuclear power. It's a newer type of nuclear power, and we can, um, we can do good with this. And now, to sum up, because I want to leave enough time for questions, um, what we're trying to do with this new next generation nuclear technology is um, figure out a way to make safe, low cost, proliferation resistant, lower waste nuclear power that can work well alongside solar and wind and hydro and geothermal and other types of carbon free sources. So we want to solve these existing problems and increase the share of renewable energy as the world moves towards the grid of the future. And there's uh, hundreds of development efforts worldwide that are working on these advanced reactor technologies. And I think we have a lot of room to do good in the world with this new science. And thank you all so much. And I think there's a bit of time for questions as well. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry for rambling. Uh, yeah, thank you, Leslie, for a talk that was technically informative and spiritually very inspirational. The idea that a graduate student can look at a, a staid field and say, hey, they've been making all these wrong assumptions for 50 years for reasons that we understand. And I hope every one of us is, is thinking about our field and wondering whether the same kind of transformation is, is appropriate and, and how to bring it about. But meanwhile, we have a nuclear engineer on the stage. So we'll take our microphone toy here in WEP, and it will go to the first person who throws up their hand, and I, I actually Liana, could you uh, help deliver it over on the other side? And, uh, I was so nervous about the prospect of throwing that. <laughs> it would have, <laughs> would have been very embarrassing. Uh, thank you, Dr. Devan, for the lecture. Uh, I just wanted to know, like being a grad student and an engineer, you know, your, how was your phase from an engineer to entrepreneurship? The, the, the phase, uh, how did you balance your state of mind? Ah, I, um, yeah, so for a number of years I was doing both simultaneously, like finishing up my PhD and then starting up the company, and I think I, I just, like, didn't sleep for months at a time, so it was, um, it was, it was a little bit tricky in that regard, um, but I don't know, in, in sort of a, in sort of a broader sense, I found it very energizing being able to, you know, work on different things, like to be able to work on both two very distinct technical projects, um, you know, the reactor design for this, and then also the, um, the waste simulation for my thesis, and then also being able to work on the, the business development piece, because that's, I mean, that's like one of the aspects of being entrepreneurial that I, I didn't expect to like as much as I did, like learning all the nuances of like setting up a business and the legal aspects and like hiring people and, and structuring it and, and negotiating for funding. Um, that was, it was something that I, I didn't expect to be getting into and it really enlivened everything else. Uh, thank you for the great talk. I just wanted to ask, did you consider the thorium-based cycle uh, in your uh, multi-soil technology? Uh, also, although, um, uh, although that th th thorium is, uh, uh, reduces, uh, reduces the waste and also uh, is more abundant on Earth than uh, the, uh, the conventional plutonium and uh, uranium-238, uh, why is it much less spread than those two, even though it's a non-weapon-grade uh, fuel? Oh yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, so we, uh, we thought about the thorium molten salt reactor designs and, and they have a lot of benefits, as you said, but they can be trickier to commercialize because there isn't a supply chain yet for thorium fuel. So the light water reactor fuel that we use, the 5% enriched uranium-235 fuel, um, there's, that's the same as what's used in commercial nuclear reactors today, and so it's just, it's just much easier to get. You don't need to, you know, persuade fuel manufacturers to make it the way you would um, with thorium, because thorium doesn't have really an established mining cycle yet. Um, and one of the other trickier aspects of thorium is that it's much more abundant um, on the Earth, but it doesn't, um, it's much more diffuse as compared to uranium. Like in uranium mines, you can find um, very distinct veins of, uh, of the uranium ore, 
whereas thorium tends to be, um, you don't get distinct veins of it, so it's hard to find a concentrated like thorium mine, for example. Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have two questions if you allow me to ask. First, would you elaborate more on nuclear waste that power plant create? The second question is, in Germany, uh, the council for Angela, Angela Merkel has announced in 2011, May, that by 2022, almost all our uh, the nuclear power plant will be shut down. Would you elaborate why Councillor uh, Merkel has announced such a thing, or why they decided to do so? Thanks. Certainly, and thank you for the questions. Um, so nuclear waste, uh, the, basically the isotopic spectrum of the nuclear waste that we produce is very, very similar to what's being produced in a conventional nuclear power plant. We just have less of it, slightly under half of what a conventional nuclear reactor has. And that's, you know, on the one hand, that's an improvement and that's great, but on the other hand, it's, it's really not good enough. And so kind of what I urge all of you to work on if any of you want to do your own nuclear startup is figuring out better ways of addressing that waste problem because I see that as being really the Achilles heel of the industry because the waste is, um, it's radioactive for hundreds of thousands of years. You need to either find a way to contain it or a way to break it down and that's, um, that's a, a crucial piece of the puzzle to be working on. Um, initially, in the early days of Transatomic, we had thought that we were able to get much higher burn-up of the spent nuclear fuel, but we realized as we were iterating on the design and ran more detailed calculations, we realized we were wrong in our initial assumptions, and it was, you know, only the factor of two that we were able to get. And it was something that was, you know, it was a tough realization for me because that nuclear waste piece is, you know, ultimately, that's, that's really what we need to solve. Um, so I urge you all to work on that, please. <laughs> um, and then uh, Angela Merkel's uh, 2011 decision. So that um, that immediately followed Fukushima, and it was really interesting to me um, in the months um, and years following Fukushima to see how different countries had very different reactions to the event. So um, Germany and Switzerland, and I believe Italy as well, um, had dramatic decreases or even shutdowns of their nuclear programs. Um, of nuclear power reactors within their countries, and you know Germany is moving nuclear waste out of the country. Um, whereas other countries like China, in particular, really doubled down on their nuclear investment and increased their focus on advanced nuclear reactor technologies, in particular. Um, and so China, in the years following Fukushima, actually, uh, their um, uh, Gosh, I apologize. I don't remember the exact numbers on this, but they have, um, you know, on the order of funding for hundreds of engineers, like just working on one particular type of advanced reactor technology, just looking at kind of one flavor of molten salt reactor technology. Hundreds of young engineers. I think the average age of the engineers in that program is 28 years old. So China's response was, all right, we're going to start a new Apollo program, effectively, for advanced reactor technology, because that's, that's what we need to do to lead the way for nuclear. There's more over there. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is, what do you think of nuclear fusion power plants? Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I fully support them. Um, close friends of mine work in, um, in various types of fusion, like some formerly at MIT's Alcator CMOD, um, others at, at ITER and beyond. I think that's ultimately, ultimately the future. Um, I think that if we can get fusion power up and running, it would solve a, a tremendous spread of of the world's energy problems. Um, but it's it's tricky. It's a it's a much longer road, and you know the the quip is like fusion is 30 years away and always will be. But I think that I think that the problems are solvable. But I think that we need to balance that long-range thinking with shorter-term bets, like the advanced fission reactors that exist. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, my question would be primarily uh, about the nature of the startup. So um, I believe this kind of startup is very particular because it does not produce single component, it produces uh, the whole reactor. 
So I would like uh, to hear uh, your story. Um, um, I believe this takes a lot of courage to do. Uh, so why, uh, how do you think uh, that uh, your company will be different from other companies producing maybe similar or attempting pro pro to produce similar reactors? Because we have uh, big nuclear giants nowadays. So how do you feel that you can compete with them? Thank you very much. Absolutely, and thank you for the question. That was, yeah, in the early days of the company, it was something that we put a lot of thought into, like figuring out, like, do we want to, you know, sell the reactor wholesale? Do we want to become a developer? Um, and what we realized, the best strategy would be to develop the reactor design, and then we would partner with an EPC, um, and the EPC would build it for a utility customer. So in some respects, it would just be licensing that technology out so we wouldn't have to, you know, become a, a nuclear construction giant in addition to doing the technical work. Um, and so that's, that's one of the pathways. And then alternative pathways that could work would be, well, you know, you develop, um, like, particular types of, like, you try and figure out, like, well, what are, you know, more conservative off-roads along that path? Like, if that, if that ultimate goal doesn't work, could you say, like, well, in developing this technology, you know, we figured out uh, a type of moderator that works really well or refueling um, pathways that work well, better ways of processing fission products that we could then um, manufacture ourselves. Like, you know, where does the bulk of your intellectual property lie? Or, you know, we uh, developed like better types of software for modeling this type of nuclear reactor and we could sell that software to other companies that are working on nuclear technology design. So it's this sort of combination of like, this is ultimately where we want to be as a business 10, 15 years from now, but you know, we have to be more conservative in figuring out nearer time horizon um, alternative strategies. And that allows us to kind of bootstrap our funding as we move along as well. Great questions. Thank you all very much. Before we go, of course, we want to honor Leslie with one of our <clears throat> cow souvenirs, but I wanted to pick up with one final question. In this morning's uh, interview online, you mentioned that one of the differences between the 1950s and today is the emergence of computation as a way to winnow designs. Would you care to elaborate that on a, a, a little bit further in terms of your own work and, and what you think the challenges are? computationally, uh, well, uh, where computation can make the greatest contribution. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that's one of the most transformative pieces, kind of comparing uh, what they had in the 1950s and 1960s and today, because they, um, 50, 60 years ago, they had to, you know, they did some hand calculations, and then they, they physically built a prototype and figured out what the results were for that. So it was, you know, a, like a decade iteration on um, figuring out what the reactor design would look like. Um, and with the high performance computing that we have available nowadays, you can iterate on you know, a thousand different types of design in the space of a week. So you can investigate this, this wide design space and really, really rapidly hone in on, um, on what works best from a neutronic standpoint, from a thermal hydraulic standpoint. You can see how the neutronics and thermal hydraulics interplay with one another. And I think that figuring out um, better ways to, to improve that software is actually one of the best ways to fix that impedance mismatch that I mentioned before, figuring out how nuclear can have cycle times that, that move much more quickly than in the past. And that's by moving as much of the design work to computation as you can in the early stages before you start building experimental prototypes. Thank you. Your MIT brother, Professor Omar Knio, who is the director of WEP, and I would like to give you a plaque. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very, awesome. very much. Yeah. I so appreciate it. It's such an honor being here. Yeah. Oh, sure. Thank yeah. you. Oh, pardon me. Oh, I'm sorry.